Good evening from the Washington Center of the University of California. And I see that um, we do have a full house there back in Towson. Uh, and welcome to what is a cooperative venture here between the Washington Center of the University of California and Towson University and the uh, Political Science Department. Uh, it is um, it's a pleasure to, um, uh, to get together uh, the two schools and, and to work on a subject that is of interest to, uh, to students, I think, in a large number of places. The subject of White House communications, the way in which a White House is organized, and the, the ways in which a White House uses the news media as a resource, and the discussion of the relationship between the White House and the press. It is an important relationship to study, uh, not only because it uh, is an interesting one and involves the president, but it's important for us as citizens for what we know about our government. And uh, we are interested in the, in the president, what he is thinking, what he is doing, because he is so important as an initiator in our political system. Um, as we pull together our course, I'd, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to thank Larry Berman, who is the director of the Washington Center, who was very uh, creative in, uh, in figuring out ways to, uh, to make this work, to Roger Brack, who is the uh, information technology person who was working wonders here, and to Polly Adams at uh, Towson, who is uh, doing the same there. It is, uh, it's a pleasure to work with you, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to our, our discussions. The way that we're uh, using this course is to look at the subject of White House communications from a different angle than we uh, normally do. We're going to look at it from the perspective of officials and reporters, those who are involved in the relationship. And uh, we want to look at how they see each other, how they use each other, how, uh, what kinds of information policies they work on, how they see their own jobs, and how they see the jobs of the other side, uh, sometimes the adversary in, uh, in their relationship. And over the course of, of um, the period from now through um, uh, May, we are going to be speaking with uh, several people who work in the White House and have worked in White Houses, including uh, Dan Bartlett, the White House Communications Director, Scott McClellan, Press Secretary, Mike McCurry, who was the Press Secretary under President Clinton from 1995 to 1998. We're going to speak with uh, reporters, Helen Thomas, who is the Dean of the White House Press Corps, and Fran Lewin, from Associated, who worked at Associated Press at the time that, um, that Helen was working at United Press International. Uh, they both uh, were covering Bess Truman and uh, Mamie Eisenhower, and then went to the West Wing to cover President is still at the White House. In fact, today she was uh, asking a lot of questions of the press secretary um, mm -hmm. about uh, weapons of mass destruction and intelligence information. Um, we will speak also with um, uh, Bill Plant from CBS. Alexis Simendinger from National Journal will be coming into the classroom at Towson, and so will April Ryan of American Urban Radio Network. She too will be coming into class there. We'll speak with Mark Orchard, who is a BBC correspondent, who is going to talk to us about uh, Tony Blair's operation in addition to uh, looking at the White House operation. And uh, we will talk to Bob Deans of Cox newspaper about covering foreign policy uh, from a White House angle, who was he was the past president of the White House Correspondents Association. And we'll also speak with the current president, Carl Cannon, who is with National Journal. So we have a lot of uh, interesting people to talk to on both sides, and uh, you have the, uh, the course outline, and for any of you who are not part of the course, uh, who would like the course outline, um, we would be happy to um, uh, send it to you. You can um, get the address, you'll be able to get my address from the, uh, the website from the uh, Washington Center of the University of California. The, the course is being brought in part through a grant by the University System of Maryland 
a Wilson H. Falcons professorship that I received for 2003-2004, and the, uh, the idea was to develop information on uh, White House communications and then use that information in a course. And I've been working on uh, developing a database of presidential press conferences, and you all will be able to uh, get some of that information. We'll talk to people, uh, the reporters and officials about press conferences, and when I'm back at Towson lecturing, uh, I will uh, give you information about that. Uh, the way we'll work the course is we're going to have conversations here, and then uh, after we finish, then uh, Professor Corsi will speak with, uh, with you about, uh, about the sessions and, um, and the ways in which they uh, work together with the, uh, the readings that, uh, that we have been doing. Uh, tonight, our first session, uh, we are going to start with an historian, William Seal, who knows more about the White House and has written more about it than I think uh, than anybody uh, that we know. You are the expert on the White House, uh, the architecture of the White House, but also way beyond that. In his book, a uh, two-volume work, The President's House, which is a beautifully written book in addition to having so much information in it, is uh, very good in bringing together the context of the White House with the uh, political and, and uh, social ties uh, that are reflected in the White House and its furnishing. So, uh, uh, William and I are going to be uh, talking about the, uh, the White House as a, uh, as a building and as a symbol, and then we will talk some about uh, staff and about um, publicity operations uh, over the years. Um, uh, Dr. Seal uh, has his PhD and his uh, master's degree from uh, Duke University. He has worked as a, uh, an advisor to the White House and the Smithsonian Institution he is the editor of White House History, a journal, a uh, very interesting journal that is published by the White House Historical Association. Uh, when looking at, um, at, at the White House, what, were the, what was the idea in, uh, in its creation of it as a symbol? You know, today, when, um, when they're visiting heads of state come, uh, come to Washington, and they want it to be photographed with the president. It is a very important symbol for them. Uh, for example, I've been looking at press conferences and trying to figure out why do we now have so many joint press conferences. And one of the reasons is that this in Texas State want that photo with the president, with the White House as a background. Uh, it is, it is a, a, a very important symbol for us uh, domestically, but now worldwide. When the White House was created, uh, the thinking that went into it, was it important? As, was it the importance of the symbol? Were they thinking of it as a, uh, as the, uh, as simply the house of the president? What were the ideas? And who, who discussed it? Well, in the, uh, it's it provided for in the Constitution by, as the president, the house will be provided for the president and the capital will be provided. It um, uh, wasn't specified that it'd be a symbolic house, it was inevitable. And George Washington, being the president, took this under his wing and set out to build something far greater than what's here now. And you know, he ordered the city laid out and everything. And uh, so he was very aware of the symbolism of it all. And it was built you know, on a scale of grander, far grander than anything in the United States. We've lost sight of that uh, with everything so much bigger now. But it was a, a vast, vast house. And it was built to be a great communicator from the start. Everyone who's lived there has used it that way. It's inevitable. And, uh, of course, today with the press and the communication being what it is, this is magnified. But you can go back to the earliest days and find the same. And Washington's own concern that it be important enough that people, foreign visitors and people to say that's where the president lives. But it was the Congress who specified that the president lived in a specified house. And that probably is its descent from kingship, because there are certain little traces of that in the presidency anyway, and uh, uh, a king and a palace. When they, uh, tell us about the, um, how the plans were, uh, were developed. It, it was Congress involved uh, beyond funding? Were they involved yeah. in, at all in the, uh, in the development? Congress had nothing to do with funding. 
was taken under George Washington's wing, and he personally handled and managed everything. And he was a very rational, sensible man. You know, he had never traveled outside of North American continent. He had been once to the, the West Indies with his brother, who was dying, to get citrus and so forth. For but he had never traveled. He had seen pictures in books. And he wanted something on a level with what people of importance lived in in England primarily. And that's what he got. He got a Georgian house built by an Irish builder. Uh, and um, uh, no, the Congress had not a word to say about it, except to complain. See, it was communicating a lot of things from the start. The second floor wasn't up, so the Congress was raising the cane about it, about how expensive it was and how big it was. Who could ever live in anything? It was bigger than 10 churches. Who could ever live in anything like that? So it had already was well underway with its um, communication before it was finished. Did, uh, did they have any impact? You said that he had a grander idea when he, uh, when he began. He thought big, and he had a French engineer who was a veteran, uh, wounded in the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, Pierre Charles L'Enfant, who designed the city for him. Of course, Jefferson opposed it, Madison opposed it, Washington wanted a big city like in Europe. And L'Enfant set it out, and he set out big buildings in it. We don't have the drawings for what Montauk wanted for the White House, but we do know that it was to fill the crisscross between New York Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue, had they been extended and crossed. So you can measure that, and you can see that it was a huge house, five times the size of what was ever built. And by Montauk's own admission, 25 feet taller. It was huge. Washington approved that, and the sellers were all dug for it. And then they had a run in with Lafon because he couldn't get used to the committee system of the new nation. They thought it was Washington was a king, you know. So he had to be fired. And, and uh, they went back to committees and they kind of badgered George Washington down to the smaller house, which was still the biggest house in the country until it was probably right after the Civil War. Uh -huh. uh, who was on the committee? What was the committee Well, that first it was friends of Washington, gentlemen, he called them. They didn't have, get any fees, they came in. That didn't work at all. He couldn't control them really. Oh, they'd have a sick horse and wouldn't come to the meeting. So uh, he got rid of them after about two years and appointed a committee that was paid, a commission that was paid. And they met here and they met regularly and they attended to the business. And they hired practical people. Uh, the buildings here, White House was built by people from all over the world, but mainly Scots, Scotland, two parts of Scotland, the Highlands and Edinburgh. And they, um, came here and did all the carving, which I'll show you a picture of later, and, and the unusual things about the house. And then many of them went back home. I found them, strangely, through the Masonic records, uh, the York Wright Masons in Edinburgh. They had all their little and the notebooks and, and the names attached. See, every Mason who would do a bit of work would cut his symbol into the stone. So President Truman, when the house was remodeled, removed all those stones and sent one to every Masonic chapter in the United States and Mexico. So I wrote them, and they sent rubbings and pictures and everything. So those we took to Scotland and went into the Masonic records and were able to connect these actual work and who they were and where they were from there. They were all top of the line. They were all top of the line people. And when war broke out between England and France, there was a moratorium on building. And these men were like, like uh, speculators, real estate speculators. They'd build a house and then sell it. They were all invested up to their nose, and they fled illegally. They left and came to the New World, answering an ad to build the Capitol in the White House. Um, so there was a, was the ad run in papers uh, throughout the world? London, Paris, and they got in trouble in Paris. They thought they were encouraging people to immigrate. Uh -huh. uh, and then they got to uh, Edinburgh and uh, Dublin. And so they, they didn't find, they found that they just didn't have the crowds to Oh, they didn't. They didn't. And the few that they had wanted to stay in the city. So they were boom, Philadelphia just exploded in New York, too. They didn't want to leave. They had a lot of work. They wanted to get them over here. And they weren't very nice to them when they were here. It's an interesting story because it's on the edge between being paid by the job, like a contractor or a freelancer, or being paid by the hour. And the commission wanted to pay them by the hour and make them check in and punch the clock, so to speak. And they didn't want to do it. So it was trouble the whole time. But it got built largely, I think, because of the personality of George Washington. He was worshipped. He was worshipped all over the world, even in England. He's considered the greatest living individual. And uh, I think they wanted his house to
in the uh, in the commission. Did uh, was did, did the commission work through a, a lot of compromising? Oh yes. And who did they have to compromise? Washington. <laughs> Until he was out of office, then they could push Adams around, the second uh -huh. president. But Washington, who ironically is the only one who never lived in the house, was uh, the one they had to deal with. And when he when they cut the scale of the house down to a fifth. He went to the meeting and he was a little sore about it. So he made him double the amount of ornamentation on it and, and other things like that. So we'll see. And, uh, How much did Washington see before he died? Okay. It wasn't finished, but it, he saw, he would. He could stand in uh, Lafayette Park today and he would know it. He'd have to squint a little bit. It's the same house. Uh, would you like to take us through? Yes, I'd love slides. to. I brought some slides. To, uh, you know, I don't know where a camera is in this new thing. Uh, is that the camera? I don't think. Uh, well, I brought some slides to sort of run through the story of the White House rather quickly, so we don't have much time. But we can have a person. This is the first and only state portrait ever commissioned in American history. And it's a copy, in fact, of one commissioned by uh, Lord Lansdowne, the Earl of Lansdowne in England, of George Washington after the American Revolution. And the federal government had a copy made of it hangs today in the White House. This shows the first president as people thought of him, as a king. It's like a royal portrait. Uh, this is the facade of the White House that you know very well. It could be in any postcard you send from anywhere. Next. In this, in this uh, facade, people often think of this as, uh, as the, uh, the front of, of the house. It is the business front. Uh -huh. so this side was considered for business and the back side was considered for family. This portico or porch was added on uh, in 1829. It was not part of the original house. The house had no front porch, as you'll see from other drawings. There's the original drawing of the front of the house uh, by James Hobbit. He was an Irish uh, immigrant, a builder, a very well trained in Dublin. And he came and worked in Philadelphia and then in Charleston, South Carolina. And when Lafont had to go, Washington was going on his southern tour. And he was introduced to it by people he liked. And a year later, remembered him and brought him up to Washington and put him in charge and always had a lot of faith in him. And he designed, he knew how to deal with his clients, unlike Lafont. He designed a house that an English squire would have lived in in the country, which Washington decided that was appropriate for an American president. See, it had 85 acres around it. It was going to be a sort of farm. Had, uh, had Washington seen any of his work? Uh, what, he, I, he think, I have to speculate on it. I think he saw the old courthouse in Charleston meeting in Broad because it looked very much like this house. And, I, and that sounds just like Washington, you know. And then there was a portico I think he had built that Washington had breakfast on. I can't prove it. No one wrote it down. Here's the original plan. That, that drawing has been restored, you'll be glad to know. But I always liked it with the hole in it. Top. That's the entrance hall. Uh, it's the same plan exactly today when you go there. This oval room at the bottom is the blue room, and this room over here to your left is the east room. And there they are, and this, that's the size they were and everything. It was originally a back porch, like Mount Vernon. And strangely enough, the White House is a place that changes all the time and in some ways never changes at all. All the doors to that porch are still cut, but they had the doors cut and the stone cutters had left, and the porch wasn't built. So it's still there with little wooden windows in the bottom. But this is the same house uh, uh, as designed. One thing interesting about it is the original Linster house that is patterned on in Dublin was a much more complex house with ante rooms for all the ceremonial living. Washington had this simplified like an American house. They're not secret stairs and, and ante chambers and places for stewards and things. It's a pretty much wide open plan. What did he think were the essentials of a house, of a president's house? Well, the East Room, for example, in those days the Congress brought bills to the president, and the East Room was for that purpose. The Congress was to come in person and present the bills to the president, and that sort of thing. The Oval Room was there for a reason, because when the president received uh, men callers, they came by, they had to apply, and then they were admitted on Thursdays at the levy. They came and stood in a circle, or, or an oval, and he was at the head of the oval, and he went around and spoke to everyone. And when he moved to it, his tem temporary house in Philadelphia, he knocked out the back wall of the room and put a bow in. So I'm sure that oval blue room is, is what he had in mind. It was never to be. It was not really used that way. 
But, you know, he thought there'd be a zone for private living and a zone for ceremony, and state ceremony, which he thought was very, very necessary to define the presidency as different from everybody else, even if it was elected. He would go to a, an inter entertainment as a private person and let it be known, and then he'd shake hands. But if he went as president, he did not shake hands. In fact, he carried a fake hat and put his hand on a dress sword so no one would try. It was, very, it was experimental years. You know, at the beginning, he didn't know. This is over the front door. And if you ever go to the White House, the tour takes you out this way, and nobody ever looks. But it's one of the most, mag it is the most magnificent piece of carving ever done in the United States, uh, in America, before the 19th century. Uh, that, that garland up at the top is 14 feet long, cut into stone, cut out of uh, a quiet creek down the Potomac. The flowers, the old Scots just went crazy. Could have been all terribly out of style for them, because the simple classicism was in. But Washington liked his ornament, and they said, okay, and they knew how to do it, because they'd learned his apprentices. And then this is what they did. Uh, they, their period of 10 years was taken to clean all this and conserve it. So it all is now conserved with paint. It had 42 layers of paint on it. But originally, it was whitewashed by the Scots, and that was the hardest coat to remove. Did Washington uh, design? Did he have a role in designing that? I don't know. He approved it, is all I can say, because it wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have dared do it without him. And he loved it. And it is funny that you should ask that, because at Mount Vernon in the mantelpieces, a lot of this ornament was already there. And I can just imagine Hoban saying, well, we can do this, you know. Because Washington didn't know. This guioche, as it's called, this Grecian chain under the window, that's under a window. And it's shown without any paint on it. That appears all over the house. It's in the mantelpiece in his office in Mount Vernon. It's a beautiful job of stonework. The stone isn't work, it's pretty bad. And the Scots whitewashed it to keep it from getting rain in it and cracking when it froze. So they put this heavy coat of whitewash on it, and um, you see traces of it. It's almost impossible to remove. Where, um, where did the stone come from? Aquia Creek, which is below Mount Vernon, it was not owned by Washington, as some books have said. It was below Mount Vernon's own, it had been a quarry established by a woman named Margaret Brent. 1699, and it still produced this stone, and the government bought it, uh, bought the quarry. And then they began running out, and they bought Seneca up the river in Maryland, which was, was this light stone to begin with, and it started began turning out this dark stone, which the Smithsonian built out. This is the first published view of the house, the first uh, graphics of the house, drawn about 1805 and published in 1807. So you see what it looked like originally. There's no porch. You see the blank over over the you have the front door, above the front door, and then there's a blank. Well, that was to have the American Eagle, and all. it never had any of that. Did, they, uh, did Washington plan that the public would be coming through the house? No, that's Jefferson, and good question. That was Jefferson entirely. Jefferson, and it's not as democratic as it sounds. In Europe, all stately houses were open to the public at certain times. Uh, you could go, anybody could go in if it was clean, you know. And uh, they'd go in and look at the big purple public rooms, the state rooms. Jefferson opened the house in 1801, in April, because he had gone through stately houses in Europe, and he wanted the public to be able to do that. That's how he saw them in near Europe, you know, all the Madame du Barry's house and all those places. He would never have had access to that. And, but it was open to the public part of the day. And so that started in 1801, and except in wartime, it's been convenient. And now, well, uh, not now, but uh, recent history, it's a million and a half a year to go through that house. This is the house, you know, it burned 27th, 22nd of August, 1814. The British burned it during the War of 1812 and the invasion of the United States where the uh, British moved from the shore up through Maryland and uh, a group of sailors came up the Potomac and burned this house down. The Madisons fled and as that Madison ordered the picture of George Washington taken down and she was more scared for herself because of the General Coburn had said he was going to take her to London and make her march in chains behind this carriage. But anyway, <laughs> they burned the house. Uh, the, the same man who was the fire expert of Wellington in Spain was there, Lieutenant Pratt, Richard Pratt. And he devised it. It was very ceremonial. They, surrounded, they went in and prepared it for hours, piling up the furniture and putting lamp oil and ma on mattresses. And then they had javelins all around that were flaming. And, um, they fired a shot and they threw them in the windows and the place blew up and it burned and burned until the rain came and stopped it. So that's what was left after the fire. It was soon reconstructed, and it was reconstructed quickly, uh, and this is an old uh, painting by the 
French minister's wife, of the finished house looking from the back. You see how rough it is all around it? And uh, they put the, the wings on each side were built by Jefferson. And here on the left, uh, where one day the West Wing would be, it would be much talked about in this course. And um, uh, it's a pretty authentic picture. It turned up in France, <laughs> just parenthetically. You see the horse? Mm -hmm. To the right of the horse, you see the hole in the bank? That's where the water closets, the toilets emptied from the second floor. Jefferson had water closets put in, and they just emptied right out in the road. It was strange to see that. I knew it from the documents, because they had said this is what they did, but I first saw a picture of it, and I'm not sure the lady knew what that was. How come, how much of the White House today, of the exterior of the White House, uh, remain? All of the stone walls are still there, thanks to President Truman. Uh, and, and then you, you do see, um, and you do see Oh, yes, when the paint's taken up. This is the house finished it, after, finally in 1833. Everything's done. Staircases, everything's finished in the administration of Andrew Jackson. English print in 1833. How was the, how was the house viewed by the public? Was it well known? Did oh, they see oh, there it, it, is, it was uh, already a White House by 1806. Uh -huh. It was so big and so white. It was a white house. And they got to go live there the 4th of July and uh, New Year's Day, anyone could go, and they did, and there was a reception, and uh, uh, then it was open, of course, every day. And then in Jefferson's time, he took the treasures that were brought back by uh, Lewis and Clark, and uh, Pike, and all, and put them in the entrance hall like a museum, so the public went there, even two little bears that were brought back. And he, um, so it was very much open to the public. People went there all the time, but remember, there weren't any trains, and Washington was pretty isolated. 400 miles from the ocean. It wasn't regarded as excessive? <coughs> no. That'll be later, when they began putting fancy furnishings and things like that. It was still, in Jefferson's time in the 1820s, it was still pretty much General Washington's house. He was safe. I just threw in a few history pictures. Here's one of uh, the 30-day presidency of uh, uh, William Henry Harrison, the great hero of the, the old Northwest. He got the chill in all, at his inaugural speech, which was a mere two and a half hours long, and it was freezing, and he caught pneumonia and died. Um, there he is, the first to die in the White House. Not the first to die. Actually, the first to die in the White House was a, a little child who was a slave child, three months old. Walking to Jefferson. Next. Here's the house at the time of the American uh, War with Mexico. 1846, 48. Uh, you see the uh, the general area is becoming more civilized. Uh, the house is, is big. It's still huge. If, if we could go there and look at drawings and things, all that circle you see in front of it was all fenced away. There was plenty of security there. It was all all fenced away. Uh, here you see it a little better. This is the house Abraham Lincoln first saw as president, coming home from his inaugural. That statue is in the front yard because, because James K. Polk, after the Mexican War, wanted to be identified with Jefferson. Jefferson brought in Louisiana. He wanted to bring in you know, California and all. And uh, his wife thought it was so silly that she hung a portrait of Cortez in the blue room, showing that he was the conquistador. <laughs> <laughs> that picture is still out in Tennessee in the Polk Museum. So here's the house in all its mighty hulk. The window's open. That never will happen again. And uh, you see the swag over the door. This is 1861. And those trees had been planted for security. Security was always an issue with the White House. As early as Washington, uh, he always had a close friend with him, and they were always armed wherever he went. Uh, James Monroe used to put sharpshooters around behind the balustrade up at the roof because of the fear of, of problems, because Europe was besought with that trouble. And in Lincoln's time, the window over the front door began, began to be the place where the president addressed the public, because people would come serenading. With railroads, Washington was getting more people, and they would come call him out at night by torchlight, and he'd make a talk. Sometimes it was funny, depending on what the era what that occasion was. And in Franklin Pierce's time, there were threats of assassination, and so they devised and built a little corridor upstairs, and the president would stand in that window with candles all around the window, and he'd make his speech because they could knock him to the floor if he was in disturbance. Well, Lincoln made his spe speeches from that window, and you'll remember after after Appomattox. The Marine Band, which has played at the White House since 1800, they were gathered in front of the front door, and he said, I can, uh, I feel that we've, uh, I forget the language, it was great, but we've won the song Dixie at war, 
and now I will appreciate it if the band will play. The band began to play Dixie, and the, the assassin, John Wilkes Booth, supposedly turned to the man next to him and said, that's the last speech he'll ever make. It was a night, two nights before the assassination. That statue was removed in 1873, and it's in Statuary Hall now. How often would a president speak? All the time. When, when the Congress was in session, a lot. Uh, Andrew Johnson spoke about every week. And who would come? Oh, sometimes a thousand, fifteen hundred people with torches and lots of little drinks and under the belt. And uh -huh. they'd come usually singing. The only hostile one I ever read about or found out about was John Tyler. And they called him out and burned him in effigy from a tree. <laughs> but ever, usually Anything it was friendly. Uh, Anything <laughs> <laughs> yes, he switched parties. <laughs> but it was, uh, um, uh, you know, they'd come from the taverns and things and march down the street singing and carrying on. And sometimes they'd get invited in, but not much. This is the funeral of Elmer Ellsworth in the East Room. It's the first Union casualty of note, which he was shot over on King Street in Alexandria, Virginia, right in front of what is now the Holiday Inn, pulling down a Confederate flag. He was a member of the Lincoln household. He roomed with the son Robert uh, on the second floor, and he was a gymnast, a fireman gymnast from New York. And he was killed, and they brought him here, and. I thought Martha would be interested in this because this is a, the equivalent of a news photographer that did this picture. He is a, a, a William Waud. Oh, what an artist. Uh, it's a shame he didn't continue. He's in the same ilk as Winslow Homer that did the drawings for the newspapers during the Civil War. He did this drawing of Elmer Ellsworth's funeral and the Lincoln family there in the East Room of the White House. What did people see? Say somebody in um, Tennessee. What would they know? Well, there are drawings of it. Mm -hmm. They would have seen drawings before the photograph. Uh -huh. Or if they ever went there, which not a lot of people did, they saw it. It never had the symbolic power that it was to gain in the Civil War. Because it got a toehold because it became Lincoln's house. And that really saved it, as you'll see. This is the East Room at a, a merrier occasion. It's the re reception of General Grant, who has returned from Vicksburg and his triumph there. And here's old General Scott. He's got gout so bad he can't stand up, sitting down there so fat. And then uh, President Lincoln and Mrs. Lincoln and the guest of honor, little General Grant, who was small. And sometimes these occasions were several thousand people. People would faint, it was so hot. But it, it, the rising Union triumph was taking place. Lincoln, within a short time's coffin, would be beneath that chandelier, having success. The Grants moved in in 1869. As a, uh, a, 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 he was to be the peacemaker. The war was over. The hero of the Union moved to the house. They had this picture painted of the ideal American family being themselves. It was hauled over in an ox cart the day after the inauguration and hung up in the Red Room so the public touring the house could see this typical American family and how happy they were and how great they were. It was widely published in prints for sale, such is the way the White House has always been used. Uh, there are messages that it can help convey. Here's the East Room uh, in Grant's time. <coughs> with um, Actually, it's in the summertime when they've got slip covers on things. But uh, it was a huge room, 85 feet by long by 45 feet wide. And held as, during some of the receptions at 4th of July, we get up to 6,000 people. And they would put steps up to the windows, hoping people would just get out. They quit serving anything. People wouldn't stay very long. How did they, uh, where did the 6,000 people come from? All over everywhere. I mean, they were hack drivers, they were newspaper editors, they were, it was every sort of people that came in and shipped the president's hand. Sometimes his hand would be blue. And, and you know, the day he signed the, uh, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Inauguration, he was very particular about his hand. He didn't, he didn't want to be hurt, so he would tremble on the sign. But he shook 6,000 hands that day. And uh, uh, this, one of the great rooms, I guess, in American history. Those huge, it's always had three huge chandeliers. It wasn't finished till about 1830. And these were the second set of chandeliers. No, I'm sorry, the first set of chandeliers. There was one more that General Grant would put in after this for his daughter's wedding that took place in the room, and then the ones you see today. Was, uh, was there an issue about the, the uh, amount of money that was being spent on furnishings? Always. But you see, the government really puts up very little. Every president was given $20,000 in administration, 
And back in those days, his salary was $25,000. And that $20,000 was to cover everything in the house. And in Lincoln's case, of course, his wife went out and started spending money, a lot of money. And it, um, it created a, a, a problem for Lincoln, you know, when he finally saw the bills. And uh, it was really a problem. It was always a problem, as it is today, getting furnishings and things for the house. It's not like a house in Europe that's furnished by the government. This is the green room in Rutherford B. Hayes' day. Just there to show you what it was like in its Victorian heyday. And Very similar to how Lincoln it is. What would it be used for? Uh, uh, receiving. Uh, uh, lots of little conferences, you'd say. The president would speak with somebody at a party. That room originally had one door to it. And they would close the door and, and talk to their uh, political people and, and that kind of thing. There are three parlors. You know, the red room, the blue room, and the green room. And this was the uh, uh, parlor usually that the president stayed in during the reception. Because it's right next to the East Room. So right next to the East Room. Willie Lincoln's body was in there during his funeral, the Lincoln's son. And, uh, here, President Gar I seem to be long on assassination. Here's President uh, Garfield, whose re wound was not as serious as President Reagan's. And here he is uh, in, in his death agony that lasted several months. And uh, Alexander Graham Bell has come to try to sound for the bullet that was in him, but the bed springs got in the way, and the, the sounding would never work. And so he developed uh, gangrene. And, and when they took him to the beach, thinking he had rallied the cow, he very suddenly died. During that time, there was a reporter uh, who, who uh, stayed, they stayed around the clock. Uh, and stayed down in the uh, telegraph room and then uh, came down. Uh, there was a, uh, a letter which uh, you had uh, uh, in yeah. your book where a re the AP reporter uh, was writing to his wife at 3 o'clock in the morning and he was reporting on the president's health. And so he said that to, uh, to see how the president was doing, he would walk down the hallway, the door was slightly ajar, he would listen for his breathing. And then he would report that the president was still alive. And he also said Mrs. Garfield lost all her hair. Remember that? Oh, she yeah. lost all of her hair during yeah. the time. Well, you know, this was taking place at the west end of the second floor, but the second floor was divided in two and before 1902. The offices were all upstairs, too. So the telegraph room was at the other end of the hall, and there was this big corridor we'll see in a minute. And the family had seven rooms to live in. And the rest of the house was public downstairs, and then offices just crammed above. So the, the office space is basically what's over the east room. Yes, that's what they have. The ceilings are low. And of course, you notice the gas light fixtures. Mm -hmm. And uh, all that. How many people would be working in, uh, say, in that office area, the office space that's above the east room? There were 16 office employees pretty regularly up until Cleveland. And then it began to jump. And they got to up to around 30 by McKinley. And they were just packed light bulbs hanging all over the place. It's hard to believe it was in the same place. Yeah. What, uh, what occasioned the increases? The, the pressure of business. For example, uh, well, the president had long since ceased signing everything. Uh, way back in the 1820s, teens, Jackson didn't sign everything. And then James K. Polk started the voucher system to try to cut down on paperwork. And it was this. It was this I guess like in any business or office, just at certain intervals, it becomes overpowering, and you say, okay, let's reorganize. But there were just vast quantities of paper that would come to the president's office and then were sent out to the different departments, but they had to be reviewed in the president's office. So everybody who worked there uh, had their own responsibility. First women to work in the office in the late 1880s. And from then on, there were always women there. But uh, given the office situation, I'm not sure they wanted to be in there. It was a very crowded, one little toilet in the back end of a room with a screen around it. And um, uh, it, it was an acute situation in the office. But it's hard to change anything in the White House because everybody's in a hurry. You know, that clock starts going, and then the president moves in, and it's not going to stop for anything. And then just, it just becomes a small matter to go through the trouble of <coughs> And here's the entrance hall. Every business caller called here. And a guard took his card or a note from him and gave it to a messenger who ran up through that door on the left and ran up a little back stair through the family quarters down to the office, showed it to the secretary, and if the secretary, who was the second most powerful man in Washington, 
And if the secretary chose not to have this person see the president, the person was not going to see the president. But if they did, then they went up a stair that's out of the picture over here to your left, and they went up uh, there. Now, in those days, the president held public hours, usually two hours a day during the week, and sometimes the line would go throughout the front door for so many people. And you know you're familiar with the famous Lincoln uh, spoil system, people trying to come in and see him by the car load uh, at various times. In 1889, there was a proposal to, to try to hoodwink the Congress, in a way, into celebrating the 100th anniversary of George Washington's inauguration by enlarging the White House. They'd already learned they couldn't tear it down. So this was what they were going to do. You see the old house in the middle with the portico added in 1824. These huge wings came out with guest rooms and all sorts of rooms, and then, uh, then the grade drops in the back, so those greenhouses were below the grades. You could see the river over them, and it made a huge quadrangle in there. And there was, uh, there was going to be space for the press. Well, th not in this one, but in the next one. There was a subsequent one in 1899 that had enormous quarters, including showers, for the press, and telephones and everything to really accommodate it. It was McKinley, who was very, uh, very astute with the press. Was that uh, part of Carol and Harrison? That was Mrs. Harrison. Uh, she would have gotten, uh, um, she would have gotten by with it, but she died in '92. Right. So it's, it's interesting that a, that a woman, the first lady, would be uh, so involved. She's one of the, mo the neglected of, of all the first ladies, the most neglected. She was a very bright woman. She was one of the pioneers in the DAR, and she's the one, the one of the ones that, being founded by working women who wanted to use this ancestry business to show that they were just, just like other women, you know. And, and Caroline Harrison said, forget it, get political. And she held instructions in the Blue Room on politics, because she was very good at it. All First Ladies are good at that. And she is the one that put the DAR on the political track that it's remained on. And she's a very interesting woman. There's no biography. And there are papers. But she died of a, of a Bright's disease on the this is the blue room. We don't need to linger on it, but this is the blue room in its Victorian heyday. It was painted Robin's Egg Blue by Tiffany, and uh, the ceiling was silver. and gave the effect of snowflakes falling down the walls. You can imagine that didn't last too long. The, uh, the president, Tony Blair, had a, a press conference uh, not so long ago, this past year, in you know, which they, they, they uh, were in Cross Hall, and the blue room was behind them. Oh, really? And so, yeah, we could see through to the blue room, and then there's no more. You know, Roosevelt wanted that for Frank D. Roosevelt. Here's the Blue Room four years later, after Theodore Roosevelt had remodeled the White House to suit a more modern presidency, building a modern office. With, oh, the Congress the Congress gave more trouble over that office than anything. He said the president's moving out of the White House. So they called it the Temporary president, uh, Executive Office Building for the longest time. And this room is very significant historically. When an ambassador come, or a minister comes to the United States, almost all ambassadors now, they present their credentials in that room. Jefferson started, the one who killed all ceremonies, he started the most endearing one. The president stands in the middle of the room beneath the chandelier, and uh, whichever chandelier it may be, and the ambassador enters with the Secretary of State, and they read addresses to each other, and the president looks at his credentials, shakes hands, he becomes the official ambassador. Today, interestingly enough, thanks to TV and so forth, Ambassadors come in, they have their pictures taken, they go through all this, then they say with their families, would it be possible for us to have our pictures taken in the Oval Office? <laughs> because it's more famous now than the Blue Room. This is the upstairs study in uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's time using the old desk. Uh, uh, that's, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's not, it's in Taft's time. That's the private study on the second floor. The president never totally gave up working in the White House and has not today. He still has a study in the treaty room. He did away with all the decorations. This is 1909. This is the first Oval Office. It was built by Taft when he enlarged the Roosevelt West Wing. And he built it. It is on the Oval Office today. Was, it, this was torn down in 1934 and replaced by the same one that's there today, which has not changed. This burned in 1929. Was uh, this in the same place? Yes. The Oval Office in the yes, day? it is. Uh, and uh, the the reason Taft did that and made it oval was because he wanted it to identify with rooms in the house. 
people had said, oh, we don't want to meet. Congressmen wouldn't want to meet in this place because it was like an outbuilding or something. So Taft thought by putting a building, a room that resembled the most famous room in the house, the Blue Room, that that, and it worked. It created the office. Even he wouldn't sign bills in there. No bills were signed until Woodrow Wilson, who actually used it as an office. Were there pictures of it, or did when uh, when people thought about coming to the White House, they still thought in terms of going in the, the mansion? House, the mansion. House. And so. anybody in Congress thought he was important enough to go to the front door of the mansion, and they had created a new side entrance, which is where you would go to it today. But uh, everybody does today. But these officials thought they should go in the front door and go straight up to the old, to the president's office or the study. They didn't like meeting here. But Taft uh, was a very shrewd in doing this because it did work. And they still, they still had the receptions. Uh, so, for example, Theodore Roosevelt had reception, reception in 1900. Oh, yes. You mean the public reception? The public reception. They stopped and didn't stop until 1929. And how many people would come through? Six or 8,000. They had gotten it to a fine point, by the way. You couldn't bring automobiles into the grounds, and you, were, you literally went through. I mean, you went there in a bed run. You shook your hand <laughs> and, and went. And uh, the Hoovers did away with it. They did it the first year. Uh, 29 was a first. 30, he went fishing. And then when the Roosevelt's came in, Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted to start it up again. And it was such a nightmare. He said, never again. He goes to Hyde Park. And they did it once. There was too many people and too much handshaking and, and the Secret Service going bananas, you know, with all this. Anyway. What about the, um, the other times that the president had where he would meet with members of Congress, meet with important people, you know, just citizens who were coming through, who were going to present their credentials to the secretary? Basically, the chief of staff today. Right. How long did those last? You mean those daily? Yes, daily uh, sessions. Probably FDR depression period, uh, and I think they still lingered. You still had groups of Boy Scouts coming in, uh, uh, people like that. Which uh, you know you, you do. Yeah. Uh, you do today as well. And, and sometimes so they would go to the East Room and then meet somebody or sit with them a while and have the picture taken. And then same. Exact same way royalty did in Europe. But they, they um, did away with the hours, like uh, two hours a day, say, yes. two hours a time. Yes. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt didn't do that. Mm -hmm. not that, not that, in that dressy way. I think the separation of office and residence helped with that. How did the Congress view uh, the building of the West Wing, the temporary office space? They didn't like it. They didn't want it done at all. They thought the president should stay in the White House. Because remember, there's this whole history before this of for people trying to tear the White House down. President Arthur tried to tear it down. President Andrew Johnson tried to tear it down and build a presidential palace. I've been looking for the drawings for 20 years. If you ever find them, come see them. But this house that was drawn to be in Rock Creek Park. And Congress just, no, no, no. And then suddenly the president wants to live out in an outbuilding or in a wing. And they didn't like it. Like it bit, but it had to be. But there was a press room in the new plan and uh, facilities for that. And the president, it was called the, not the president's office, but the president's room. It never became the office until the Oval Office. And the Oval Office was never called that until the end of the Kennedy administration, and then not much. And it really got in, I guess, under Johnson. It just called the president's office. Well, here's some work going on in the White House in 1948. President Harry Truman had trouble with chandeliers swinging when they shouldn't have been, and plaster filtering down, and his daughter's piano leg went through the, not the piano leg, but the leg of her piano, <laughs> went through the floor, and, and uh, they moved out, and they moved to Blair House, and the house was uh, remodeled, as he liked to say, but look at this next one. Uh, they really skinned it. They had to. It was a fire trap. Uh, it was a, the inner structure was so, so much wood that one fire bomb in a Coke bottle could have set it on fire. So they skinned it entirely. They went three stories underground. They uh, changed everything and made a house of about 60 rooms into a house of 134 rooms. And then by using steel, as you see, they didn't have to use the heavy brick backing of the stone. So they got space for air conditioning ducts and all that kind of thing. And every room was air conditioned and heated separately from every other one. And, and the air could be tested every hour for poison. All sorts of things. And it, this this uh, structure you see in the middle that makes sort of a rectangle or whatever, that's still there. That's how they emptied the house. 
They built that thing through the floors and the walls, down into the sub-basement before there was such. Mm -hmm. And they pulled all the contents of the house, the innards of the house, out through that, up through the window, and out those chutes that we saw. And that's how they cleaned it out. And they rebuilt the White House inside. Where did, the, where did it go? All, all those uh, Unfortunately, some were saved, some things were saved, mantles were saved, some doors were saved. Most of it was landfill at Fort Myers to create the, the uh, playground, the uh, sports ground there now. This is just, I just wanted to show an artifact. The White House, for all the fact that it's more or less new inside, 50 years old, has artifacts everywhere. This was bought uh, in 1818 by James Monroe, and it's still used all the time. The plateau in the middle of the dining room table. There's Washington's portrait that we started out with, looking from the green room into the east room, where it was first hung in 1820 and 1929, having always been in the red room. This is the entrance hall. Now talk about presenting people to the public. This is this staircase. It's the photo op staircase. That never existed that way. That was a wall there. And President Truman, when the house was rebuilt, said he could not stand having his picture taken while he was going down a long stair. He was a very natty dresser, probably the nattiest in the history of the entire White House. And he didn't like it. So they went through more drawings than you could imagine, dozens of them, and finally came up with this idea, where when the president entered at a state occasion, they played Hail to the Chief, he and his party come down the steps, and then they all stand there, which you've seen in the newspapers before, and have their picture taken. And it was a something created for a photo opportunity that's still used today. Here's the cross hall, which President Bush has made a lot of use of. And, and uh, uh, there's the Steinway piano at the, in, in the East Room. And he stands in the East Room, and you see the hall. And of course, there's the uh, classic picture of him after the Iraq uh, business, where he's leaving, having made a speech, and he's going down the hall, and they catch him from way up high. Uh, very good picture. The Green Room today. The Blue Room, as the Clintons uh, uh, redid it. Mrs. Clinton took a great personal interest in it. What would it be used for today? The reception rooms. Uh, they'll have, they have, you know, party after party after party. And some of them they don't pay for. Right? You know, institutions yeah. pay for them uh, that, uh, that they support. And, and they'll, they all handle it very nicely. Uh, you, you get great food and and drinks and things, and just walk around in the rooms just like you're at home and sit on the furniture and everything else. And uh, they have social aides, however, that are young military people and you better behave. They're past masters at getting people out of there who had too much to drink. You don't even know they went. Uh, <laughs> and they watch it pretty well. But this is, of course, the Red Room. And uh, uh, just another of the parlors with the American furniture. The State Dining Room, which will seat 110, used to seat 60 until they enlarged it, where Theodore Roosevelt enlarged it. And they try every way in the world to get more people seated in there and have lots of trouble with it. Sometimes they use round tables, they used, used to use horseshoe tables, uh, but uh, uh, it, it's probably, we'll seat only so many. Here it is for a party with the round tables and the little smaller chairs. Henry Kissinger sat in one and fell flat on the ground, the legs went out from under him. Here's the family dining room on the main floor. Uh, just, a, just what it is. And, oh, and one thing, up until the uh, uh, Kennedy administration, there were real candles in that light fixture, the only one in the house, and they would burn real candles. Very apparently quite good. The East Room today, with the piano, and the third set of chandeliers ever in there. Washington's portrait. When did those chandeliers come in? 1902. And they were remodeled a little because everybody needs more and more and more light, you know, than they used to. And they've got spotlights in them and indirects in them and everything in the world. And they were made in New York by uh, Caldwell and Company. You know, the hip top of the line. Here is the second floor transverse hall or cross hall. Let's linger on this a second. The house has on each floor these long halls that run crossways to the plant. And upstairs, this was a corridor always. And that door you see down there had ground glass doors in it, and that went into the office in Lincoln's time in, in the late 19th century. This was taken in in 1902 by Roosevelt as part of the house. It never was used a lot, but today it's really used. Those are three living, it's divided into three parts, as it always was, but they're three living rooms. And if you go in the east end, by the east room, you have to go up, and they now have it ramped, but you used to go up three steps because the east room ceiling was higher than the others. And I think that 
irregularity came from Washington, from the commissions cutting the size of the house down. I think they were all have had ceilings like that, but the rooms were too small for that. It has 22 foot ceilings, the rest of them are 18 feet. But the bedrooms are open off of that, the sitting room. Here's the most famous bedroom. The Lincoln bedroom it contains the bed that Lincoln couldn't stand, that Mary Lincoln bought and spent money when he said you, you could have been buying blankets for our soldiers. That's the room that's supposed to have ghosts. Here's the cabinet room, uh, designed in 1934 for President Roosevelt when he enormously enlarged the uh, uh, <coughs> wing using, the, uh, Herbert Hoover had planned to do that and, and the depression stopped it and Roosevelt, that they couldn't function with it the way it was. The Oval Office decorated for George Bush, the first President Bush. Decorated for President Clinton. And here's the White House from the air. I show you this because uh, uh, here's your old house in the middle. There are Jefferson's wings. Theodore Roosevelt's office on the left, the west wing as it developed. On the right was built during World War II secretly with a bomb shelter under it and the word never got out. Never one word about it. Not one workman said a thing. But you have the original house and the original executive offices were all in the yard. Those two huge buildings, the do double hole in the middle one there and the huge castle looking one on the left, those are only the third buildings on their sites. That's where the departments, war, navy, and all that were, post office. They're only the third on their sites. Uh, to the right is Treasury, begun in 1833, and on the left is a State, War, and navy, navy, which combined three departments. It was considered the biggest office building anywhere. Uh, and of course, they're obsolete now. But notice the angle of the streets. 16th Street down Meridian Hill. This is the original plan laid out by George Washington uh, in the days when the uh, city was young. And everything full of stumps and old fields and so forth. This is how it's developed and there it has remained. That's the last of the pictures I have. Well, that is not a criteria because they uh, looking to in its development, you can see public state was a, uh, was a factor. Always. Um, what kind of uh, continuities do you see in uh, presidents and their dealings with uh, with reporters during all of that time period? Did uh, the presidents regularly uh, deal with reporters, and uh, and how did they feel about the press? Well, I think it depends on the man. Uh, it was um, uh, McKinley was a master, of course, mm -hmm. and then he had a, 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 a good press man who became ill and died, and, and then George Courtly forward. He was a real master. One of the most interesting people in the whole history of anything. I mean, he went from secretary to being two, holding two cabinet positions. Uh, uh, he came in with, with a special in shorthand. That's how he got to the White House. Then, uh, but uh, I think uh, Lamont, uh, what was Dan this? Lamont. Dan Lamont. Dan. I think Dan Lamont with Cleveland. Cleveland kind of was a big, mean guy, you know, and he could get mad at the press. He called them mules and slobs and everything. And uh, he's, he had Dan Lamont. He was a very cool-headed, clever man. And you know uh, the story about Cleveland who got in his second administration. You know, Cleveland was elected one, and then he was defeated, and then he came back to another one, the only one in history. He got cancer in the roof of his mouth. Was it half of it? Mm -hmm. It was terrible. And they, it was a depression time, and they were afraid public opinion, with, with, with morale would go. So he went on a boat out from Massachusetts to sea, and they tied him down and gave him laughing gas and all things. And they cut that out of the top of his mouth and put a rubber filler into it. And he, he was, you know, could not be happy. They got him back to the house, and he goes out on the front porch to John, you know, his face wrapped up in bandages. And so the press caught on to it. The press were all out on the head. Dan Lamont gathered them all in the barn and talked them out of reporting it, and it was never reported until his death. It's the most sensational scoop of the world, and they just, but Lamont was, a, was a fabulous. He was later a cabinet member, and all. Um, but he had these good people for you, didn't they? Uh, were there staff people, uh, we'll say, before the Civil War? Uh, were there times when Staff people regularly dealt with the press, or did the president uh, mostly deal with the I think president very often, and I think it was a very friendly thing. Mm -hmm. 
but one person that has never been approached from this point of view, but was a journalist, was uh, of course George uh, uh, Lincoln's secretary. <laughs> We're so good. Uh, no, no, hey, and. Uh, yeah. Anyway, anyway, hey, and Nicolay, George Nicolay of Belgium, he was a newspaper man that Lincoln brought in early in Illinois before he was even elected. And the extent of his dealings, who knows? The newspaper people moved in and out. They went into the office. They were around all the time. They had messengers uh, that, to head to the telegraph office because they weren't used, allowed to use the White House office. And in later years, in the later 19th century, the messengers' bicycles would be lined up on the driveway. And each group or man, a person had a, a messenger, and they'd give that scoop to the messenger who would run it to the telegraph office in down on Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, telegraph it into their papers. And that went on for a long time. Yeah, um, uh, L.A. Gobright, who was the, uh, the first uh, bureau chief of Associated Press, uh, in his uh, recollections uh, uh, of men and things in uh, Washington, uh, talked about going to, uh, to, to see Lincoln. Um, there was a, a report that they had heard about um, a battle during the war. And so he said, on one occasion, an important telegram was received at the War Department announcing a grand union victory. But for some reason, unexplained at the time, the secretary was not disposed to communicate the figures. Failing thus to, attempt to obtain him a department, several of the correspondents hastened to the executive mansion in order to secure the desired information from the president. The cabinet meeting had just adjourned, and several of the members were leaving the room. The representatives of the press had no sooner sent in their cards to him than he welcomed them in a loud voice. Walk in, walk in, be seated, take seats. And before they had time to announce the object of their visit, he remarked, I know what you have come for. You want to hear more about the good news. And so they felt that they could uh, regularly go in and, uh, and, and see the president. So in a sense, at that time, uh, there were no fees. Uh, mm -hmm. Reporters could go from one to another. So Go Bright would to go up to the White House, but he'd also go up to uh, to the Hill and uh, to the departments mm -hmm. as well. Um, what uh, what feeling did um, did reporters have about their right to um, uh, to cover a president and what right they had to be in the House in the uh, the executive? My, to report on things. my impression is they were kept very much at bay. You know, they couldn't directly quote the president without his permission, yeah. and they were pro prohibited from that from the start. And and uh, I, I think they were on sacred ground. They treated it uh, very carefully uh -huh. because of the August man. I mean, they were more connected with the man. But you know, everything was more open. Uh, you know, the, the president Har Benjamin Harrison used to go down to the East Room every day for an hour, and anybody who came in, he'd shake hands with, kiss babies, and all that stuff. And um, I think it was just a, a more fluid mm -hmm. relationship then, uh -huh. until it, which became impossible. Uh -huh. um, but I, they wanted a story, but uh -huh. there, were, there were devices to keep them away from that, and they could be kept out. Uh -huh. One of the, the people that, uh, that you write about in uh, the President's House who uh, uh, clearly had an idea that, uh, that the President was a fair game in his house and the, the, uh, and the social events were something Public had a right to know about was um, uh, Emily Briggs, who wrote under the name Olivia. And uh, in <coughs> one of her uh, letters uh, that were published under the name of um, Olivia, she talked about the the right that um, that the public had to know. That there and, and there's some distinctions in her mind. And she's particularly she does a lot of color reporting in a sense and a lot of social uh, reporting. And she said that card receptions, such as are held at the homes of the cabinet, Chief Justice Chase, and General Sherman, in a, a certain sense, are veiled under the sacred seal of hospitality. And the newspaper correspondent dare not, cannot, without violating all delicacy and good taste, make a pen picture of the men and women whom the dear people at home like to know about. A presidential levy is altogether a different affair. It is public. It belongs to the people. When we go to the executive mansion, we go to our own house. Our sacred feet press our own tufted Wiltons. We recline on our own satin and ebony. We are received graciously by our own well-dressed servants, and the people have a right to know, through the columns of the press, the exact, the exact state of the situation. And, um, yeah. and 
and you can see that view then uh, gradually uh, take hold by reporters, although uh, the president and his staff always are regarding, uh, regarding their, uh, their lives as something that, uh, uh, that they should decide what is being reported. But um, you can see back there, they, they did have that uh, kind of tussle. Um, so it's really in Cleveland's administration that we get, uh, we get uh, staff that are particularly attuned to uh, press needs. And in part, it, it uh, would seem that it's because there's such a demand for information about the president. And if the president is not going to provide the information, somebody has to do it. And it's a recognition of hiring people like, like um, Lamont and also in, in Harrison, um, Elijah Halpert, who had a uh, was secretary who had a background in the press as well. And then continually, it seems that the secretary, who is analogous to the chief of staff, has that kind of uh, background, like John Addison Porter for uh, McKinley also uh, had that, uh, that background. And then Cordelia, while he didn't, he certainly was the master of, uh, of publicity. Seemed to be able to do anything. And they published little directives, uh, little books about how you did, what the press could and couldn't do, uh, what everybody could and couldn't do who worked in the White House. You were told exactly what to wear, when to wear it. If you worked in the office, your desk was to be absolutely clean when you got up to leave. And uh, there was even a little booklet of how to act when you were on horseback with the president. <laughs> you were not to ever let your stirrup go ahead of his. And only one at a time could ride with him. And when he nodded, you could fall back so the next person could come up <laughs> and talk to the president. <laughs> I think under Teddy Roosevelt, he was so wild, you know, they had to have some rules. I know his wife wanted some of those. <laughs> when, they, uh, when they moved to uh, the West Wing and, uh, and the press had its own room. In, in, before that, they actually had space in 1896. Uh, William Price, who's a reporter, yeah, talked about having that uh, the desk, the having that uh, table in the, uh, in the hallway. Um, they developed tacit understandings when the president walked by, they were not allowed to talk to him, but he could talk to them, and then they would respond. But yeah, uh, still, uh, that's still pretty true around the house. <laughs> In, within the White House, uh -huh. right? you don't address the president unless he addresses you. Well, with the with a newspaper report, yeah, but say with reporters, though, they they don't uh, they don't see him yeah. uh, walking uh, walking generally down the hallway. Uh, they seem to be able to keep them uh, keep them away. It must be Mrs. Woodrow Wilson at first who stopped that, mm -hmm. as far as I can see. She created a separate entrance to the West Wing. Uh -huh. It did not go through it where everyone else was. President's walks. Mm -hmm. uh, in the area that the staff had, um, the the people that were, uh, we'll say, the ones that were above the um, the east room, when they had space in the uh, in the west wing, how many people in say in 1902 when they moved in, how many staff people were there? Oh, you mean of the president's staff? Yes, about 30. Uh huh. In all, and um, uh, you went in a. a a big hallway with the guards there, and there was a cross hallway behind it. With the doors into the uh, secretary's office. You see, when the when the wing was built, it was the secretary who was on the main axis. He was the important one that the wing was there for. The president had a work room, and then as Taft remodeled it, the president had an important work too. But it was originally a staff. The staff was it. Then on your right was the press room, which I don't think it held over. It had about twelve desks. Yeah, telephones, mm -hmm. and there was telegram, uh -huh. uh, and uh, then there were wait, waiting rooms on the other side, and then there was staff. And then there was staff room that was kind of behind where the press behind was. Behind the press. Were they able to, were reporters able to go and talk to those staff people? No. <laughs> they were not, they were not to talk to any reporters or ever say anything without permission uh -huh. from the, the secretary. They could re release no news, could give no details of anything. That's in their little booklet. Uh -huh. So that in, in a way, there's a continuity there. Yeah. And, uh, and that, no matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican. And you, know, um, and you know, in this period, they were already destroying typewriter ribbons. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. I was working on some State Department stuff. Typewriter ribbons were taken at the end of the day and, and destroyed officially, formally, uh -huh. because of, you know, someone could get a hold of them. Were they worried? Who were they worried might get a hold of them? I don't know in that period, uh, in the 90s, but it was Spanish-American War, I guess, and there were spies, there were problems with that. 
uh, all over the place. And uh, more, I think, if you go in State Department records, it's practically a spy story. <laughs> They're everywhere. Every little coastal town you ever heard of, and everywhere, as it goes up toward the war, but Spanish War and all, and I think they were highly aware of that. I don't think any of this is so terribly new today. It's just more technical, more broadcast. When did um, uh, the White House uh, take on a persona where it, it will say, say in the news, uh, the White House said today? Oh, that comes with television. Uh, President Truman, when he did did the White House in, or got it, it's, he, he, he restored it the way he did so it would last as the home of the president. He had a choice, make it into a museum or build another place. He said, no, it has such symbolic power. They can live there, Washington built it. So he had those walls saved that George Washington had put there. And so he already realized the power of television. Living across the street, when he gave interviews uh, that happened to be televised, it was right at the end of his administration, there weren't many. Always wanted the White House in the background. And it was. And then, when the job was finished on the restoration, there was a broadcast room, a huge 40 foot long room. But of course, it was outdated before it was finished. It was beneath the entrance hall in the old kitchen. It was a nice, handsome room with a desk for the president and where the radio, you know, and all could be. And uh, uh, it was all set up. Well, then Eisenhower used that room. He became concerned about television and, and his advisors. And they hired the great television uh, uh, pioneer, Robert Montgomery, who came in and did everything he could to make Eisenhower not camera shy. Uh, they do everything. They, they put up a wall and painted it black and put little holes in it and peepholes for the cameraman to photograph him while he talked. All kinds of experiments. The most difficult being when they had to make him convince him that he had to powder his head so it wouldn't shine in the lights. But according to Robert Montgomery, he didn't like that. But uh, the, uh, there was a lot going on until the Kennedy uh, administration came in, which had all had been working on PR long before the presidency. You know, that one of that new book, Jack, you all seen that the picture book on the market, the time life did. It's the, the work of a single photographer that had already started in 56 or 7, photographing the members of the Kennedy family and President Kennedy in a almost theatrical way glamour picture. Yeah. The, the book's about it. I was so astonished to see that that had started so long before. Um, and uh, uh, of course it becomes more and more professionalized. But after all, Andrew Jackson, who was a scrawny, is a, sca a, a scarecrow, and he had a old bullet in him with lead that was killing him. He and Thomas R. Benton had got shot at each other one time, and, and he got this ball in him. He got his arm fortunately Benton got shot from behind. But, but came out better. And so Jackson, they fixed the arch into the East Room. It was, the East Room was finished for him. And they had 150, it's in the bill, 155 big gold relief stars. They pasted on the wallpaper above the arch. And then the band would play, and Jackson would come with his hair brushed back, and this cape they had made, a cloak with brass buttons out wide to make him look bigger, and a big collar that stood up. And he would sweep into the East Room. You know, just a, it, it, was, it was a performance. You know, which I'm sure he had done many before, but it was, they've all done that sort of thing. President um, Taft weighed over 300 pounds, which well, he was kind of tall, but he was a great big man. And he didn't like marching down the stairs to hail to the chief. Theodore Roosevelt loved it. There used to be about 30 people, two by two, and the trumpets playing, and the gates would be opened, and he had presented. But Taft was embarrassed and came down in the elevator because he thought he looked foolish. They've always been presenting themselves. <laughs> it's always been a yeah. for presidents from Adams Ford who lived there. But that unseen audience is another matter. And I think that starts, the unseen visual audience, starts yeah. really with uh, with uh, President Truman. I mean, they, I think he was very perceptive about that. Uh -huh. And then um, Eisenhower really, uh, though he uh, uh, may not have liked it, uh, really was the first television president because he's the first yeah. uh, president to have press conferences that are televised. He's the first president to have on the record press conferences. Great. And Roosevelt was, it was such a difficult matter with him because they had to be very careful in presentation because he was a and had those locked phrases and, and all. So the fireside chats, you know, they were radio. You know, you didn't see a crackling fireplace like with Jimmy Carter in his sweater. You, uh, you saw, you just heard it. In fact, it wasn't even by a real fireplace. Yeah. Well, I've, uh, 
wonder if we can go and have some questions now um, from, uh, from Towson. Are there people who would like to ask questions of Dr. Seal? No, the protests start strangely late uh, uh, in, with the White House. Now, the, the uh, hanging the president in effigy is the only one I really know of before later, turn of the century. Wilcox's army, when was that? That's 97. wasn't much, really, I'd say it's not an issue much till the 20th century. Uh -huh. You know, the suffragettes who were out there. and uh, uh, Is it because the presidency becomes more important as seen that the president is going to be one who is going to be uh, pressing for legislation? It's, and so it comes about at that time. The president becomes the button, the push yes, button. Right. I also suspect it's because more eyes are on the White House. Because mm -hmm. if if, if, if you have a demonstration, you, somebody's got to see it. So you're assuming that the world's going to see this and be impressed by it. And I would think that the Illustrated Press would, that would show these, these people, like they were doing in London. Of course, that was already well underway. Uh -huh. So in a way, it's, it's, um, it's getting into his picture yeah. that you know he's exactly. going to have the space. So but it's an interesting it. question because today, with the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, the Secret Service would love to close Lafayette Park and that whole area and make it all just pedestrian area uh, and be able to lock it when they you know, close it because of, uh, of uh, terrorism. And there's just terrible pro protests, not public, but within the system and the debating within the system of that's not right. That's not right. It's the citizens' right to go there and if they protest or sleep on a park bench or whatever they do, it belongs to the American people. Now that is not a 19th century idea. I mean, the original plan, that was just the front yard of the White House. I mean, the 20s, th that wasn't around in Lincoln's time, I don't think, except they did used to come there, and it, it, it was fenced, though. It was locked at night in Lincoln's time. And um, uh, that is an attitude today, and it's been one of the hardest parts of the del deliberations over how to rethink and recast which has to be done. It's been done, as you know, from the night all through the history of the White House has been a rethinking, so it works better. And that's a definite factor in the planning of how to permanently, at least for the next 30 years, fix the, the area around the White House. But terrorism, of course, is a tremendous issue and bombing after Oklahoma City. Uh, so the two ideas are fighting within the same group. It's not opposing groups, it's opposing philosophies within the same. Were there, um, uh, we've, we've seen a lot of pictures of protests um, uh, during the uh, Vietnam War, uh, protests, the, uh, the March on Washington, which was one of the, the biggest marches, uh, uh, the first big march really in, um, in the latter part of the, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, there had been some discussion of having him on A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, who said during the Roosevelt administration, threatened to, uh, uh, to have a march over a Fair Employment Practices Commission. Um, but uh, that didn't take place, and there were no really big demonstrations until 1963 but, uh, in the march on Washington. But the march did not come to the White House. The, the march was really on uh, Capitol Hill, and, um, uh, and the rallying points were
first one, uh, I think, was the Pentagon. But after that, they, uh, they focused on the White the House. Yeah. And now it, it seems to be certainly a, a center, of, a natural center of protest. Uh, other questions? facility for the press uh -huh. where they could be around. Uh -huh. And that's, he, Bingham was trying to sell the idea and, and trying to get the Kennedys to agree. Uh -huh. What happened to that plan generally? Well, it probably never would have happened because Mrs. McKinley, after she went to the presentation, someone, they were pushing her wheelchair out of the room, no one was paying any attention to her, and the guy was pushing her, she said, well, it's all very nice, but it's not going to be any hammering while I live here. <laughs> well, that, that was pretty much it. So it, that that one fell by the wayside. Uh -huh. uh, but it was it was planned. And most of the drawings weren't you know wasn't done in great detail. But that, there was definitely a press room with all sorts of facilities and the press of wing. Uh -huh. And uh, McKinley on one of the trips that uh, McKinley took to uh, North Carolina, uh, he went to uh, Asheville, and uh, the place where he was going, they didn't want reporters to come in. And so he said that he wasn't going to go in if reporters weren't allowed, oh. and, uh, and that won him a lot of a lot of favor with reporters. He was very clever. Yeah, <laughs> he was. And he, he took a uh, trip to uh, the West Coast in uh, in 1901, and uh, was which was an eight-week trip, and they had uh, the Portlier in his files uh, talks about, and they had a very large contingent of uh, press. And one of the things that he was trying to do was uh, develop a dark room uh, on the uh, train so that he could, uh, so they could take, a photo take photographers with them. And I think they ended up doing that. Because they had a press car. Yeah. But even if they didn't have the, that, and I think the plan, that plan was a lot larger than the West Wing ended up being. Was oh, it's huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, the, the, the West Wing had to be in scale with the White House because Theodore Roosevelt's interest was in the historic house. And he saw it as a setting, I think, but he also was interested in it. And that's the only reason he ever gave any support of the Macmillan plan, because he called for preserving the White House. The architects would love to have torn it down, but he wouldn't hear of it. And the only remark he made about the Macmillan plan when he was shown it was, well, I'm glad you're preserving the White House. That's what he said, unlike Taft. Do we have any questions here? You know, what uh, impact do you think the uh, this visual impact of the West Wing television show has been in sort of popularizing further the uh, image of the West Wing and the White House? It's strangely believable. But of course, it makes a drama out of everyday work. And uh, I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me to say. It's been very popular. It has, and certainly uh, when uh, uh, a lot of people uh, watch it, and uh, when I know when uh, when I speak, people always want to know if that's the way that uh, the West Wing actually works, and so they they tend to think of it in those kinds of terms. And uh, but I noticed that they fought, they fell off uh, somewhat during the uh, during the Bush years. Uh, I guess starting in about 2002, their uh, their viewership uh, dropped, and I wondered if. Because they had captured something that uh, that was in the Clinton years, because they came in and talked to people and saw how things were, and I wondered if they thought that they had somehow gotten away from how the West Wing operated under under the Bush administration. And they've been trying to um, uh, to rework it some, and they they do have Republicans as well as Democrats on their uh, on their, their uh, staff, and their writing staff. Yeah. It's interesting the role. One of one of the things that, that, uh, that, that that's interesting uh, when you look at the press uh, over time that they've gotten space, but um, when uh, Cordelier was writing all those instructions, he didn't he said that he didn't want them hanging around the North Portico because they had space 
upstairs uh, outside in, in that uh, lobby. And they didn't like having them uh, outside. But reporters always want to waylay the, uh, the guests of the president and talk to them. And uh, even today, with the West Wing there, if you notice that right between the West Wing and the area that is going to be is the, the press area, the press room where the briefing takes place, there are a group of microphones. And that's a stakeout, which is uh, where members of Congress come to speak after they talk to the president. So in many ways, there are things that have changed. Um, they have uh, they have a quarters that they didn't have, but they still are using some of the same methods, and they still want to see those guests of the president. But if a congressman here. doesn't want to talk to them, he leaves them another way. Right. There are a lot of there are a lot of ways out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in different ways, yeah, they're kind of difficult. Oh. Uh, and re reporters generally come in the northwest gate, and then uh, the president's visitors come in the southwest gate. There are always reporters that are trying to see what's going on in the Southwest Gate to see who, who is coming in. Any other questions at uh, Towson? Um, you had mentioned earlier that security was a primary reason for making alterations to the White House, such as putting up trees and fences, things of that sort. Do you see the events of 9-11 maybe possibly making future alterations to the White House? No, no question. No question. I'm not sure it's going to be to the house or the grounds within the fence, but it's going to be around it, the streets around it. I think more and more and more uh, vehicular traffic is going to be taken off the streets. More and more and more. So you can't drive trucks up. You know, when President Truman finished the White House, it was bomb proof. It was considered state of the art bomb proof. Every room is a steel cage. If a bomb went off in the blue room, it would just blow up the room blue room in those days. But today, a pickup truck with the right a mixture in it, if it got close enough and had the time, knocked the thing over. So this is what they're continuing uh, in, in their replanning uh, process. And it certainly has within uh, the building itself, because it had always been that open from Jefferson Ford, as you said, it's been uh, a public house. And it was uh, closed off with no public visitors for a uh, good period of time after September 11th. And now, that when vi visitors do come through, it is a process that has to go through uh, members of Congress, and the people are screened, and, and generally it's for young people to come. And, uh, and then they've had some military people come through, too. And it's much regretted at the White House, yeah. because it was, it was an old tradition of going through, but it's a practical matter. Well, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your morning. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.